All right, so uh, we are going to be talking about managing Open vSwitch in a large heterogeneous environment. Uh, I am not Andy Hill. That is not Joel Priest. Use the slide and you can figure out the rest. Uh, we are both systems engineers at Rackspace who have been working on the public cloud for about three years now in total. So some quick definitions first. What do we mean by large fleet? Tens of thousands of hosts. Um, yeah, lots of hosts. Uh, obviously way more instances on top of that, which equates to lots of uh, logical ports and everything that you're managing with Open vSwitch. Uh, hundreds of thousands of instances, to be exact. Uh, heterogeneous, tons of different hardware manufacturers, more than is probably sane. Um, we have several majors in server versions, differing kernel versions within those in servers, multiple hypervisor vendors um, within those, or I'm sorry, hardware vendors for our hypervisors within those different hardware revisions thereof. Um, all of those kind of tweak the requirements and behavior slightly that you get when you're working with anything really, and by extension, Open vSwitch. Uh, we have six production public clouds, stretching from you know, DFW, Ord, IAD, US, London, Hong Kong, Sydney, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, six internal private clouds, so that would be, uh, we run OpenStack on OpenStack, so that's our internal Nova uh, OpenStack deploy that we refer to as iNova, as well as any of our pre-production environments, uh, CI, CD, dev, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this is a quick OBS introduction um, on sort of the flow of Open vSwitch and where it's going. So if you're not familiar with that, um, essentially you, you, have a, you potentially have a control and a management cluster that is talking down to your OBS, which in turn has a local database that it has um, reads and writes going to and from that, both to the OBS process and to the control. And um, that all exists in user space. And then there is the Open vSwitch kernel module existing below that. Um, so the main takeaway as far as um, our presentation, what you need to know from this slide is basically user space, not as fast, kernel space, super fast. So you want to be operating as much down on the kernel space as you can to get the most performance out of vSwitch. History, Rackspace, we have used OVS since I don't know, it was probably just VS at the time. We've been on Open vSwitch for a very long time. Uh, pre-1.0, one, pre 1 I believe, when we launched uh, our next-gen OpenStack cloud, we were running 1.3, one, 1.4 one, of OVS, around there. Um, been using it before that. Um, we were using it before OpenStack even launched, uh, some of, towards the tail end of the old, old legacy cloud, um, slice host days, if anybody remembers that. Uh, we were using OVS. Um, Power is 100% of the next-gen cloud, and we have upgraded OBS nine times in the last two years. So this is my favorite slide. If you get nothing else from this talk, if you are a package maintainer, if you are using Open vSwitch, upgrade OBS. We are on very new OBS, like as new as we can get for the most part. Um, Try to, yeah, if you're, you'll see, Andy will go into extensive, excruciating detail on that in a moment, but you, yeah, you want to be on newer versions of OBS. We've talked to people who have uh, not gotten expected, like what they would consider expected performance out of it, and a lot of times when we uh, dig deep on that, we find out that they're using way old versions. So please, please, please upgrade your OBS. <laughs> So why upgrade OVS in the first place, right? Um, these are the summary of the reasons that we've upgraded OVS. The main ones around performance. We also did some upgrades to make upgrading less painful. They've made a lot of improvements into how the in-place upgrade of OVS happens and makes it more palatable for us to do very often, like we have done in the past two years. Um, we also upgraded OVS because we needed to upgrade our NSX controllers. So anyone who's ever upgraded in NSX, one of the components of that is to upgrade Open vSwitch. Uh, so we had to do that a couple times. There was also a really nasty regression in OVS 2.1 that uh, made us upgrade once more. Uh, this one was around certain types of VMs. Whenever they would plug the first time, they'd be okay. But then if the 
tenant reboots the instance, it would no longer get data path flows. So we've upgraded OVS for a few other reasons, but the main driving reason behind all of this is performance. So some of the things that can impact your performance or some of the things that we've seen impact performance for uh, public cloud use case. Uh, largely around broadcast domain sizing and specific attention for broadcast related flows. Uh, just take some real care and make sure that that's behaving the way that you want it to behave if you're crafting these flows. A lot of times what ends up happening is the broadcast traffic goes to every node goes to every VIF, and instead of OVS dropping the ones that, the flow is dropping the ones that it doesn't need to, it just goes all the way to each VIF anyway, instead of kind of having a little more control over that, where you don't have to spend the CPU cycles to even consider those, that traffic that's not gonna be relevant to your host. So uh, we monitor OVS quite a bit. Uh, this is just a, Big, big chart of OVS CPU, OVS vSwitch D CPU utilization. Uh, this was in a cell that had one of those large broadcast domains that I'm talking about. Um, but then somebody started doing something a little interesting, um, and we see this. Uh, so OVS CPU went through the roof because of all of this broadcast traffic going to all the nodes. Some of it was basically port scanning and doing generating a lot of this traffic that ends up being particularly painful for OVS. Um, this was kind of in the olden days, and that's a picture of Chad. He's one of our systems engineer, and this was just a really, really bad situation, so we had to kind of take a look at what we have, may have done as an operator and kind of examine the flows themselves, but vSwitch could have handled this bad situation in a better way anyway. So around performance, I, I'm gonna go ahead and just say there's three kind of eras that we've experienced with performance. Uh, pre 1.11, I'll call it the dark ages. It's really rough. Um, you don't get performance on a lot of uh, workloads, just the typical workloads sometimes have problems. Um, mega flows, and then I'll say ludicrous speed. I'll get into each one of these. Let's go ahead and do uh, the dark ages. So, how many people in here have seen this flow eviction threshold setting and had to tune it because there's a workload that's unhappy? So, by default, pre 1.11, flow eviction threshold can cause some problems. So, flow eviction threshold is the threshold in which OVS attempts to start evicting unused data path flows. So, Joel mentioned earlier, the data path flows are the fast path. Uh, but if OVS is kind of managing that and trying to keep those to a minimal, um, you may have some issues where a lot of those data path flows get generated, then OVS spends CPU cycles managing those data path flows and it just turns over and over and over again, causing that CPU usage to go way up. It was also single threaded. Uh, this didn't get changed until a later version of OVS. It also was doing some very, uh, very specific matching on the traffic that comes in. So it's like a 12 point match. Source port, destination port, all the little details in an open flow connection, right? It was very, very specific matches. So some workloads that may require a brand new connection from a client to a server that gets a brand new source port on every single connection, well, that's another flow. That's another thing that OVS has to keep up with. That's one of, the, where, one of these situations where OVS really had a, a tough time. And there's, there's a couple of other things a little lower, but basically the more bridges that you had, uh, you also had a penalty for that. You, the more bridges you had to traverse, you kind of also got hit for that. So then OVS 111 happened, and we got mega flows, and it was, we felt really good about it. We were like, all right, Megaflows, there, there's been a whole lot of activity in the community about uh, just wait, Megaflows is really gonna, gonna help you out. And really, for the most part, you are less likely to hit that flow eviction threshold that I mentioned earlier, because instead of doing a very specific 12-point match, OBS could do some wild carding on those flows and therefore keep the number of flows that were in data path much smaller, so the performance was much better. 
But there were still some workloads out there. I mean, 2,000 data path flows for some workloads is still pretty well nothing. It's trivial. Um, so we still had some issues, but we saw really, really significant improvements from pre-111 to 111. So this is a chart of the, this is the average data path flows for one of our regions. Uh, you can see they're kind of hovering up there, and then the dip on the right is post-111. We cut almost all of our cases cut in half, right? We were very, very happy with this, but we still could do better. We still could have, we still had some cases where this just wasn't good enough. So then we have ludicrous speed. Uh, if you were watching Spaceballs in the lunch area earlier, they did away with flow eviction threshold completely with 2.1 and beyond. So now instead of a 2,000 data path flow sort of limit, there's 200,000 data path flows by default out the gate with OVS 2.1 and beyond. And this is a configurable value. And we can run all the tests that we want. We can do lots of synthetic workloads, yada, yada, yada. But for the wild, for what we see with public cloud, we've seen uh, over 72,000 data path flows uh, with some workloads doing 260,000 packets per second. Uh, we're really, that's a significant improvement before uh, 2.1. We've been really, really happy with it. This is a chart of the top five data path flows post 2.1, just to give you an idea of most workloads are towards the bottom here. This is just the top five, but we've got one guy who's kind of out of control in the 40,000 data path flow range. This is a smoke ping chart, if any of you guys are familiar with smoke ping. Right, the, uh, the colors on the chart, the non-green colors on the chart, illustrate jitter in the connection. Um, and then it's pretty clear when we upgraded this environment from 1.4 to 2.1, it was very significant performance. Our infrastructure team, this was for an internal cloud, but our infrastructure team loves this. We have much more consistent performance on the network because of this upgrade. So mission accomplished, right? We moved the bottleneck it. <laughs> uh, OVS isn't our, our bottleneck anymore from what we've seen on the networking side. Uh, the new bottleneck that we have for tenant workloads is more around the Zen NetBack NetFront driver, which has some significant improvements coming soon. And then there's the guest OS kernel tuning. You know, some people may have very specific workloads that they need to tune their kernel a little bit. So those are really the, the things that we're seeing. Just to give you an idea, uh, after we went to 2.1, we have seen no escalations come to us, no, no problem cases that we were able to go back and say OVS was the problem after going to 2.1. It's all, we haven't had a single escalation since, uh, let's see, we completed all the upgrades for production in July, I think, and we haven't had a single case that we've been able to you know, go all the way back to OVS, and that's a problem. So that was a huge deal for us. So I'm going to bang the drum a little bit more here. Please upgrade. So I, I hope there's some people who distribute OVS uh, in here. Um, if you do, please upgrade so that your customers who are using you as a, you know, using package OVS from you can really take advantage of this. Please upgrade, please. And by the way, OVS 2.3 is long-term support, so if there are concerns around that. All right, so now that we've talked about upgrades and the benefits of upgrades, how do you do it? Well, we, we orchestrated the whole process with Ansible. Um, one of the things that's kind of unique about upgrading Open vSwitch is you're losing the network connection to your host. Uh, so there can be a little bit of you know, concern around this, uh, especially in some cases if you're doing the, a large amount of hosts at a single time. So I'll just say take a look at Ansible's async module if you're going to attempt to do this with Ansible. Um, watch your SSH timeouts in particular. Uh, from experience in a pre-production environment, I may or may not have you know, taken down an entire cabinet of machines because I wasn't paying close attention to that. 
Uh, and around the impact of OBS upgrades for bonded configurations, we see uh, under 30 second data plane impact. So we do interrupt our customers, but it's a brief interruption. And for our non-bonded customers, it's under five seconds. Um, there's still some discussion and fixes going on around why the bonded configurations are taking longer, and there's a link in the slide to that, I think. Yeah. Uh, so the, but all you really have to do after that is just get the RPMs to your host and execute force K mod reload, and you're all done, right? Um, it's not quite that simple. So when we did our first upgrade, <coughs> we had something really strange happen. After the upgrade happened, uh, hypervisors, full hypervisors, were just rebooting kind of at random in one environment. And this was pretty concerning. Um, it comes back to the OVS bridge fail mode. So by default, the bridge fail mode is a normal fail mode. You can set it to secure fail mode. The difference between normal and secure bridge fail mode, normal fail mode, whenever traffic hits the host, it acts as a normal L2 switch. Secure fail mode, it's going to drop the traffic. So some really interesting scenarios can happen because of this normal fail mode. One of which was a, a Zen server bug that we found where uh, the traffic got broadcast to all of the VIFs, but we were doing some network sharing across like iSCSI and uh, a provider network, and the iSCSI traffic hit a, a VIF. That shouldn't have happened, and it causes a, Citric, a Zen server bug to basically cause a hypervisor page fault re and reboot. So it was really, really tough. Um, and you can't just say, I want to switch from secure to, or normal to secure fail mode. It's not quite that simple. If you do that, it's a data plane impacting event. All the flows on the bridge get cleared. So. That's a, another kind of wrinkle in this whole process. And then the, another, yet another one would be uh, the fail modes don't always persist like you think they would. You have to kind of change the setting in Zen Server anyway to have that fail mode persist across reboot. Oh, and some more issues around fail modes. Um, so we do use patch ports for uh, kind of moving our traffic along to the, br the appropriate bridge that it needs to go to. But if you have some misconfigured patch ports and you have a normal fail mode, this was an incident we had where uh, we had a routing loop because of that. So around, around this whole theme, we, we really, we had to secure all of our bridges. We had to go to this secure fail mode. Otherwise, we couldn't o upgrade OBS across the rest of the fleet. Uh, and the patch ports don't persist across reboot, and there's no construct within Zen servers to make them persist across reboot. So we had to kind of finagle a cron task to happen on reboot to do that. So now that we've determined that we have to migrate from this normal fail mode to a secure fail mode, here's the high level steps that we took to upgrade. We just created another new bridge, had this similar configuration to the old one that all the VIFs were plugged onto. Then we moved each VIF to the new bridge, which got them their new flows. And this was uh, a loss of just a few packets. After that, we actually performed the OVS upgrade itself. And then uh, we had to do that ensuring bridge fail mode thing on reboot. And then we cleaned everything up. So, you know, we may have had some monitoring kind of flip out because interfaces changed according to the kernel whenever we reloaded the OVS K mod. So we have to like restart SNMP just so our monitoring system doesn't lose its mind. And we did this entire process with Ansible. Um, it was a wonderful tool to use to do this kind of step-by-step -step process. And I couldn't, can't really think about an, using another tool to accomplish such a thing. Uh, okay, so there's yet another gotcha around up upgrading OVS, and it's around kernel modules. So this isn't 100% of the time, but um, we don't really risk it. Basically, if you upgrade your operating system's kernel, 
through normal patching or whatever like that, you also need to make sure that you have a matching OVS kernel module to go with that. There are situations, especially if you're doing these big upgrades where you go from like 1.4 to 2.1, where the mismatch in kernel modules, if you don't have the matching OVS kernel module with your new kernel, you're not gonna be able to have networking on the hypervisor. So um, this is another one of those things that we learned the hard way. Um, basically, if you're upgrading OVS, make sure you have the kernel module. And the way we, we do it is we don't upgrade the kernel module, or we don't upgrade the operating system kernel without upgrading the OVS kernel module. And we don't upgrade OVS without ensuring that there's, we're not missing a, a part of this equation. So yeah, kernel upgrade equals OVS upgrade uh, is, is basically what we've taken away from it. And since we have such a wildly varying environment, uh, this means we have a lot more complexity to manage in terms of getting those kernel modules, making sure they're delivered to the right place. And if you, if you don't pay close attention to this in your SSH timeouts, like I mentioned earlier, you can have a trip to the out-of-band management system uh, and try and get networking back on that hypervisor. Uh, okay, and there's still some other challenges around OVS and upgrading. Um, there's a lot of reasons. Maybe it's maybe it's not your uh, whoever packaged the OVS for you. Maybe it's an organizational thing. You can't upgrade OVS right now. Uh, this this is a problem that I, a lot of people are facing, and we've realized that not everyone can just put the gas pedal down and upgrade OVS all, like, as frequently as we do. Um, other people within Rackspace also had issues with uh, VLAN splinters uh, and the OVS VLAN bug workaround. This is not really a problem with OVS so much as it is a problem with some NICs, um, but this is really well documented in the OVS project itself. And I mentioned it earlier, but this was a, a real thorn in my side was, um, some of the components of OVS weren't really tightly integrated with the hypervisor. So um, we, we really wanted to have those patch ports just be there on reboot instead of having to hack something up via cron. Um, and just kind of a, a quick summary of the platforms that we, we've run OVS on. Uh, we have some OVS managing LXC, KVM, and several versions of uh, Zen Server. All right, so now that Andy talked to you about all the really difficult stuff that he has to deal with, I'm gonna to talk to you about measuring OBS and monitoring it. So essentially, he's doing all the heavy lifting and I'm doing the stuff going, hey, this Andy is broke. Do something about it. So before I get into the measuring part, just out of curiosity, how many people in here are actually using OBS, like right now? How many of you are in the dark ages, so pre-111? Oh, thank you. And, <laughs> and 111, at least 111? Two plus, at least two plus, yay. So I'm glad we are preaching to the choir on like half of our presentation was just begging you to upgrade when you're all already there, so that's good. Um, so measuring OVS, uh, a lot of, almost, I would say, in fact, all the uh, graphite slides you saw earlier, uh, that data was generated from a script that Andy and one of our other uh, coworkers, Jason Kolker, worked on called Pavlov's Pavlovs, get it? Um, and that basically is, pretty straightforward Python script that's just sending data on packet counts and CPU utilization and all that, opening a socket to graphite, dumping it in there, and then you can aggregate it there. Uh, this is awesome. It gives you a really easy way to look at your entire fleet and see what your OVS is doing and see things like we showed you earlier where you can see that dramatic drop in flow counts and CPU utilization with every upgrade. So if you're not doing something like this, I would recommend it, especially before if you are one of the people who are still in the dark ages or 111 and thinking about coming up, do it before that if you're not already because it's just super fun to basically get literally instant gratification. The second you're finished reloading KMOD, it's like, oh, hey, look, the network is just screaming now. So that's awesome. Uh, we aggregate these. We use cells. So we aggregate this from the region cell hypervisor so you can get that whatever granular view you're going for. Um, and it's really useful for DDoS protection. Um, if you're hi managing hypervisors, um, like with us, we have a dedicated backbone team and you know, they're monitoring that stuff at, at the ingress, but 
Um, it's really useful to be able to see from our side anyways. Um, it's you know, super, you just look at who are your top users and if somebody all of a sudden spiked and they're, you know, uh, orders of magnitude more than other customers, there's a good chance they're a DDoS target. Um, but that, that being said, when you're at uh, a scale as large as ours, we're having problems with uh, scaling Graphite and StatsD to accommodate, because this is a ton of traffic. Um, every multiple, multiple data, set, data points for every single port on every single hypervisor, or every single instance. So um, we're running into some interesting challenges with that in some of our larger regions. Um, and so OBS in the compute host lifecycle. This uh, script is another script we have internally, uh, Offsculate. Uh, basically, this is what runs when we provision a new hypervisor that checks it into our MVP NSX controller. Um, it's evolved a little bit over time. Um, back in, say, when we were in the dark ages, reign of things. It was just a standalone Python script that we were executing that was kind of dumb. Uh, that's evolved now. It's pretty much strictly an Ansible. Um, it checks the host in. This is kind of almost on the monitoring side of things, because for the most part, you're only going to check something in once. Um, if it fails, that means that that hypervisor, there's only two reasons really it should fail. That hypervisor is having a communication issue to your control cluster, which is bad. Um, and you need to address what, what is breaking the communication between those two. Or um, if, say, you're re-kicking a hypervisor, like it had a hardware issue, you failed it out, replace that, and now you're re-bootstrapping it fresh. It has a new host certificate, and it gets a conflict when you check into uh, your controller, especially if you're you know, using a consistent node name and all that, uh, management IP that it has in the NSX controller. So you have to catch that error condition and then work around that to either update the host certificate separately or delete the node and then re-add it from scratch. So what are things that we monitor? These are the big ones. Um, we uh, use Nagios for our monitoring, and most of these are passive SNMP checks. Um, so the first ones we do is connectivity to the controller. So just simple, the OVS VS cattle commands, Am I, do I have any controllers that I am not connected to? That should always be no. Um, the main cause for that for us that can happen after the fact, uh, after something has been successfully deployed, is generally routes. Uh, we're connecting to the controller via an overlay network, and so we have to have routes directing that traffic to the controllers correctly, and thus from the controllers back. So if something were to happen that made those routes get out of whack or whatnot, um, we need to address that. Uh, SDN integration process, so for us running Zen Server, this is the OVS Zappy Sync uh, process. Uh, the TLDR on that is it's basically just the process that is reporting up to the controller uh, the status of the different OVS parts on the hypervisor, so it knows where to plug in you know, the little bits that it's, that it's in charge of. Um, there's some interesting challenges for us specifically on that because we're basically using a forked version of it to handle some internal rack space sort of Byzantine logic stuff on our SDN side. Um, so we're not using the stock. So whenever we do these upgrades for OVS, uh, we have to check and make sure that uh, our custom version wasn't stomped by the upgrade. So part of our upgrade process is to write in our correct one and make sure that's the running one. Um, so we ha our check is you know just a simple bash script checking, A, is this process running? Is it symlink to ours? And you know, does that, does that file that the symlink is pointing to actually exist to make sure that it's got all the little bits that we're expecting there? And routes, that kind of goes back in, um, not just to talking to the controllers, but uh, routes from, say, cell to cell, um, so that hypervisors can talk to other hypervisors. And this is an abridged look at our, <laughs> bridge, networking joke, um, look at our setup. So as you can see here, the blue line is the direct line between two hypervisors. That's the one you will end up taking the majority of the time. But on your first connection, you got to go down to the control cluster node, the orange line, and it establishes that tunnel at first. So if you break the blue line or that orange line, you're going to have a bad time. You've broken your tenant's isolated network or your OVS connectivity between those two nodes. Um, so that's why we're monitoring for routes. And we're starting to do stuff now that not just monitoring. Uh, we have some Rackspace projects uh, that have been brought up in a few of the Rackspace talks here, Auditor and Resolver, which are uh, along in the same vein as uh, the Entropy project. Um, and we're, I think, talk, having some discussions with those people about that, about kind of not duplicating work there. Um, 
But essentially, uh, we have some checks put in where if a host, for some, whatever reason, does alert for not having the correct routes that it needs, then Resolver can go and run a job on it and say, hey, run the task that we have, the Ansible task that we have that fixes all the routes on this and fix this connectivity. So hopefully, that doesn't come up ever. I mean, ideally, but when it does, we've got tasks to, to react to it for us. Uh, one of the other reasons this is kind of an issue for us um, is we have a brownfield IPv4 deployment. Um, so we don't really have uh, the luxury to say this is all of the tunnels are going to be established on this very large network. Uh, we have to do kind of right sizing and we have to pay close attention to uh, our IPv4 deployment. It would be really nice if our tunnel endpoints could just be v6. Yeah. And reboots. Uh, as Andy mentioned with the mismatched kernel version, when you reboot, ideally when the host comes back up, you would like it to still have networking. I don't think I should have to explain that too much, but um, that's, that's the goal that we're going for. And if you go to uh, the link there, I believe that goes to your blog post on the, yeah, goes to a blog post from Andy, a little bit more detail about the kernel mismatches and stuff. Um, you know, but you would think this would never be like a big widespread thing. It's not like anything's ever gonna happen that we're gonna reboot the entire, oh God. Um, if anybody in here is a Rackspace customer, you got this email very soon. Uh, this was from the reboot apocalypse, as I tried to get people to call it, but I don't think anybody joined in other than me. Um, so this was the Zen server bug that went around. This is why Amazon had to reboot a non-trivial portion of their cloud, and we had to reboot the entirety of our next-gen cloud. So yeah, that's a big deal if you're rebooting literally every hypervisor in your fleet, which again, tens of thousands of hypervisors. Um, you want them all to have networking when they come back up. So we were monitoring for the kernel mismatches already. So we would have known about any of that it could have potentially been a problem on. But when we did our uh, orchestration for all that, which again, Ansible, if you can't tell, we're big Ansible fans. Uh, we put in pre-flight checks for that. Um, so it would hit every hypervisor and just double check and say, hey, do I have the kernel versions I'm going to need? If I don't, we failed that host out immediately from that reboot playbook so there would be no chance that it would get rebooted and then we would revisit it and rectify whatever that was causing that problem. So I think that pretty much covers it. Anybody have any questions or anything? The default Zen server uh, use uh, open with switch bridges for management interfaces, sound connection, all connection of the host. Do you use that bridge in your installations? Can you say that one more time, please? Uh, the default Zen server pass all traffic, including management and sound connection through OVS bridge. Do you do this? So, um, not the same bridge, but yes, we use OVS bridges for all of the networks. So in dark ages, it was most fun part when everything died, including management interface. There was a lot of fun back then. Yeah. Yes, the, the issue that we mentioned with the version kernel mismatch, it would, yes, break the bridge that was our management right, interface. That's why we would get hit by that, is because OVS was managing that network. And that's why we had to do the out of band to fix that. So that's why it was so critical for us to monitor for that aggressively. If we had a 1% failure on those reboots of tens of thousands of nodes, that's hundreds of out of band Java console, you know, uh, serial over LAN console, we have to log in and fix. We had no interest in doing that. So, <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah, from your presentation, I got you using the out of three OVS module. So, do you, uh, since which kernel version would you recommend using the in tree OVS so we don't module, use or the don't you recommend that module. at all? We don't use the out of tree kernel modules. Um, we, we, the only kind of out of band things that we do are around the OVS Zappy sync process. Um, and we use the kernels and the, we compile the, those are compiled for the kernels that are shipping with Zen server. So, and the kernel ship with Zen server doesn't include the OVS module. Because in recent kernel versions, uh, main, mainline kernel versions, OVS is included, so. So this is actually one of the problems that we have with the packaging of Zen Server itself is it's packaging in the patches that you download whenever you 
downloads and server patches is, is packaging OBS 1.4. Um, and we're at a substantially higher version than that, and we can't run some of those patches because of the dependency there. So um, the Zen server, we, we compile the OBS 2.1 kernel module against the 2.6 whatever Zen server kernel. Oh, okay. So you're running a quite old kernel version. Sorry? You're yeah, running a quite the, the old... The one that we give with Zen server is... Yeah. Hey, so last week there has been a news release about Rackspace dropping open vSwitch support in favor of Linux Bridge for their private cloud efforts. So could you comment on that? Um, yeah, I think it, it comes down to um, we're doing tenant networks, and for a lot of the build-outs, they're not using tenant networks, so they don't need to have a SDN controller to manage um, their networking, really. Um, some of it is also uh, around the additional complexity that we have to take on in order to accomplish some of our tenant networking and some of the provider security that we have in place, some of the kind of value adds that we do with our hybrid cloud offering. So we're, we're using Open vSwitch and public cloud, and uh, I don't really see that going away. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? No? All right. Thanks for coming, guys.